Hello, everybody, and welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to be looking at a great topic that came through my LinkedIn feed, and that topic is can you use a capacitor for ESD protection and should you use them on signal lines? Now, this came up as a question or a topic on my LinkedIn feed and it aroused a little bit of debate among the design community. And I thought it was a really interesting recommendation because using capacitors for ESD protection on signal lines is something I had never seen before. And so I thought I would dig into it and make this video so all of you could learn about it. So let's go ahead and get started and learn about whether or not you can use capacitors for ESD protection on power lines and signal lines. Now, before we get started explaining the topic of this video, I want to go over something that's actually quite important and explain the different types of transient voltage phenomenon. Because ESD is one type of transient voltage phenomenon that can potentially damage your circuits. So here in this table, I have five different items listed. And at the top of the list is ESD. That's what most people think of when they think of transient voltages. These different transient voltages are characterized by their peak voltage, peak current, and then their rise time and approximate duration. So as you can see from the very top of this table, that ESD has a pretty fast rise time. Now all of these are about order of magnitude. So it could be slower than one nanosecond, could be faster, but in general it's roughly order of magnitude of a nanosecond rise time. Then you have EMP, you have underdamped oscillations. So this would be like a transient that's excited during switching action, such as you might see in like a switching converter. Then you have lightning, and you could have surges or power inrush. And those can vary pretty greatly. The peak voltage, peak current, and then the rise time and duration can all vary pretty greatly. So whatever mechanism that you use to suppress transient voltages, it needs to match or be able to respond to the rise time. So that's the first criteria that we use to determine whether or not a particular component is going to be suitable for transient voltage suppression. The other is the duration, so how long can it withstand that transient voltage, and then what range of voltages can it withstand. So if we look at the different options here, we've got several in this list. Obviously, TVS diodes. There's also varistors. Both of those are suitable for ESD suppression. There's also Zener diodes or MOSFETs. Obviously, these can vary based on the circuit that they're in, but they can be used for transient voltage suppression. There's also crowbar circuits. Crowbar circuits have moderate speed. They're essentially meant to uh, shunt surges and possibly faster pulses of overvoltage that could damage a circuit. You have things like gas discharge tubes. Those are meant to withstand much larger surges. And then you can even use relays, and there's a specific type of relay called a voltage sensing relay. Now those are very slow. Those are more meant for slow phenomena like surges and lightning. So this gets to the core question. What about capacitors? So this particular topic that came through my LinkedIn feed was talking about using capacitors for ESD protection on power lines and signal lines, specifically lines coming off of a connector. So let's take a look at a simple model where we model an ESD source as its own capacitor. And this capacitor, which is our ESD source, has some charge that's built up onto it, Q. Now the total charge that's contained by this ESD source would be the capacitance multiplied by the voltage that is contained within this ESD source or that gets released to some other circuit when this ESD source interacts with it. So when we use a capacitor to protect against ESD, we're essentially putting that capacitor in parallel. And then this would be protecting the IO on some integrated circuit or some other component. So we have our protection capacitor here. And so this model for understanding or trying to determine how this capacitor works relies on this idea that the charge that was originally contained on this ESD source then distributes to these two capacitors in parallel once the ESD source interacts with our protection capacitor. So if we just assume that the charges across these two capacitors are conserved, we would have Q total is equal to our initial ESD charge, and that's going to be equal to CESD plus my protection capacitor times some final voltage. And basically this is the voltage that would be seen by the IO pin 
after the charge uniformly distributes across these two capacitors? Well, it should be pretty clear that if I just equate these two things, I get that the final voltage seen across this I.O. pin to ground is just going to be the initial voltage from the ESD event multiplied by the ESD capacitance divided by the sum of these two capacitances. So it's kind of like a voltage divider, but involving two capacitors. So the only way that this works in theory is it relies on this discharge, allowing all of this charge to immediately flow directly from this ESD source over to this capacitor. And thereby we reduce the total voltage that is seen across this IO. So anybody that knows how a capacitor works should know that we can't rely on this ESD source to immediately move a portion of its charge over to this other capacitor and not allow this IO to experience the full force of this voltage. So this is a model that I think makes some unrealistic assumptions regarding how capacitors work. Of course, it assumes that there is no series resistance across this capacitor, but of course there is some series resistance across this capacitor, it's its ESR value. That value will limit how fast charge can transfer over to this other capacitor. Same thing with this actual capacitor's ESR value. So there's going to be some limit to how fast this charge can transfer over. That requires that this might only work under certain situations where you have a slow transient event. So if we were to draw out, let's say, the discharge current from this capacitor moving over to the other capacitor, it would look something like this, where we have a reasonably slow event here, maybe lasting from microseconds to milliseconds could vary pretty broadly. Now, the other thing that it relies on is it assumes that whatever capacitance you have here, it has a high enough voltage rating to be able to withstand this ESD event. And same thing over here with this IO. It relies on the idea that during the transition to full peak voltage and current associated with this ESD event, that the protection on this IO is also able to withstand this while some of this charge then moves over to this capacitor and then equalizes across these two. So it's an interesting model that I don't really think is reliable in practice. And this is why I think it's much better to just rely on TVS diodes, gas discharge tubes, and other forms of circuit protection like relays in order to protect your circuits from fault conditions and ESD conditions. So let's take this back to the voltage rating for these capacitors just for a moment. There are high voltage capacitors out there and there are even SMD high voltage capacitors out there. So how big are those capacitors? And do they provide enough capacitance in order to drop the initial voltage to a final voltage through charge redistribution? Then the last question that we of course have to ask is, even if we can find those capacitors, can we fit all of those capacitors onto a connector like this guideline states? To answer that question, let's take a look at a couple of data sheets. If we look at some data sheets, we can get an idea of what those case sizes are and whether or not they can fit around a typical connector where you might be concerned with an ESD event like this. Now I'm here in Octopart and because we're considering a situation where we want to use an ESD capacitor coming off of a component, like a connector, we would then typically want to look at ceramic capacitors. Just searching ceramic capacitors, we can go up here to the filters and I can start to look at some stuff based on DC voltage rating. I wanna look at what happens when we have, let's say a pretty high voltage rating, like let's say four kilovolts. So with a four kilovolt voltage rating, we wanna look for surface mount components. This is one of the reasons why I went for ceramic capacitors, because you can generally get high enough capacitance reasonably high voltage ratings in a small package. So we wanna see what's available here. So let's just take a look at, for example, these Kyocera AVX capacitors. Kyocera and other capacitor manufacturers typically include multiple options in their data sheets. So if we take a look at this data sheet, we can see what case codes are available for these various voltage ratings and capacitance values. So here with these high voltage MLC chips, these are the type of chips that you would want if you were trying to step down a high voltage ESD pulse to a low voltage ESD pulse, or if this capacitor was just powered up to a very high voltage in order to see if it could withstand that pulse and then shunt that current to ground. If we take a look at some of the capacitance values and case values 
in this table, we can see here that we can typically only get up to about a nanofarad with a five kilovolts voltage rating. So that's for the C0G dielectric. And if I scroll down here, you can see there's also a table for the X7R dielectric. You can see here that you can get a little bit higher capacitance, about 3.3 nanofarads, up to a voltage rating of five kilovolts. Typically, these are the kinds of values that you could expect if you were looking for a high voltage ceramic capacitor in an SMD package. But look at the package size. This is 3640. That's a pretty big package size. Now, typically, if we're coming off of a connector, we wouldn't want 3640. We wouldn't even want 0805 case size. We would actually want something like 0603, or even better, we would want 0402. So we can already see that at those smaller case sizes, we can only get to voltage ratings in the hundreds of volts. And that's not really gonna be useful for cases where we're dealing with ESD that could be at about a two kilovolt or higher with stand voltage. Now I bring up the two kilovolt value because that's actually specified in one of the DO standards. There are other standards that have similar values for with stand voltages. And so a capacitor just isn't going to be able to do the job. So you can see that here from this table and from this table. Now, as you get to smaller and smaller case sizes, you can get to higher capacitance, but as you can see here, the voltage rating goes down further and further. And in particular, they didn't even make these high voltage capacitors in the case sizes that we would need to put onto a connector, especially for signal lines. That's one of the reasons that I think a TVS diode is much better. TVS diode is going to provide that protection without relying on such a big case size. Now, let's just suppose for a moment that we were gonna go with this model and accept that this actually works, just for a moment. We wanted to drop down a very high voltage ESD pulse down to a logic level voltage in order to protect a circuit running at logic levels or a digital IO. How big of a capacitor would we typically need? Well, what you're gonna find if you just plug in some order of magnitude numbers here is that you're gonna need C to be on the order of about one microfarad. Now, again, it depends on the values of the voltages that you put in here for your ESD, your final voltage, and then what the equivalent ESD capacitance is. This is typically gonna be about you know, a nanofarad or less. Regardless, you're gonna need a very large capacitor here in order to provide this kind of filtering action. If you have this big of a capacitor on a digital signal line, what's it doing? Well, it's actually filtering out that digital signal. So if I send a digital signal out of this IO, or I have one coming into this IO, what's gonna happen here? During this rising edge, you're gonna have some of that power essentially get filtered out because this capacitor acts like a high pass filter. And what this capacitor is doing is it is limiting the available bandwidth in the channel. So you can't get all of that signal power over to the IO. And in that way, it is slowing down that signal. So that could cause the IO to not function correctly or to not read that signal correctly. So this is another reason that you wouldn't want to do this. And especially when you're dealing with some of the higher speed signaling standards that have faster edge rates, specifically with USB or something like ethernet, those signals run at faster edge rates. And so we wouldn't want to have this excess capacitance here because that capacitance is going to reduce the signal power that gets over to the IO and then the IO may not function properly. These are all more reasons why instead of using this capacitor here, you should just use TVS diodes and probably you should just use bi-directional TVS diodes in these systems. Uh, mostly because, of course, if you're dealing with something like USB or you're dealing with something like Ethernet, you could have bipolarity on one of these lines. And so you want to be able to protect against ESD in both directions. This is just more justification for TVS diodes. My view, forget about the capacitors as an ESD solution. And typically, as I mentioned earlier, you'll actually see a multi-pronged approach when you're dealing with ESD in systems that have a high withstand voltage. You may see a gas discharge tube as well as TVS diodes on the same lines 
in order to handle power surges and high voltage ESD events. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to follow me on LinkedIn if you want to keep up with all these cool design debates. And of course, leave your comments and questions in the comment section and let us know if you use capacitors as a form of ESD protection in your circuits. And last but not least, everybody, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.